Okay, good afternoon. I am officially bringing this meeting to order. Welcome to the 5,611th meeting. So I have uh, the privilege today of running today's meeting, uh, which means I'll be making some announcements, I'll be introducing our speaker, and then running the questions and introducing guests at the end. So very shortly, I will be bringing up our esteemed guest. Um, and just as a reminder for the format of the questions, we'll take questions at the end of the remarks. For those of us here at the Union League Club, please hold your questions to the end. And for those on Zoom, type your questions in the chat box. Please honor our speaker's time by keeping your questions succinct, one question per person. So um, when we get to the question part, we'll start with the questions that are here in the Union League Club, and then we'll move over to the ones on Zoom. So I am happy to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Ms. Jennifer Park. She's the Executive Director at Habitat for Humanity Chicago, a position she has held since 2011, although she has been involved with the organization for much longer. She has an MA degree in organization leadership from Immaculata University in Pennsylvania and a BA in anthropology and history from Marquette University in Wisconsin, where she also served as a resident advisor and sang in the chorus. Amongst many other specialties, Ms. Park specializes in nonprofit management and staff development. When she's not working for Habitat, you might find her on one of the Chicago Architecture Center tours exploring a neighborhood. So Habitat for Humanity is an organization that I personally have been curious about, so I look forward to hearing about the good things being done and how Rotarians can be involved. So I am very pleased to bring up our speaker for today, Ms. Jen Parks. You can say next slide. Okay, yeah, so you can just sort of verbally give Thanks. commands. Well, first of all, let me just do a mic check. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for hosting us today. We are grateful to have this time with you. Um, one of my first memories when I first moved back to Chicago, I've been here 11 years, um, I uh, was invited to a Rotary One meeting. And I was really uh, impressed with the organization. I knew very little about Rotary, and I was uh, just really wowed by what this this organization, much like Habitat does, is a global organization in, at work in communities, bringing people together. So I'm really pleased to be with you today. And I'm, again, grateful that you've invited us to share a little bit about our work in Chicago. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Habitat for Humanity Chicago. But before I dive into that, we're going to go into the next slide. So just a little bit of background around Habitat for Humanity. So first of all, have that, has, can everybody just tell me about who's been involved with Habitat in this room? Maybe raise your hand. A lot of folks. Yeah, great, great, great. Um, so Habitat is a global organization. I'm going to share a little bit about Habitat for Humanity Chicago today. Um, but we are in over 70 countries and in the United States alone in 1,100 communities. So many folks who've been involved with Habitat may have been involved on the global, on the local level, or they may have been involved on the global level. But regardless, it is uh, an organization that is addressing housing in, on a worldwide basis. Um, here in Chicago, um, we are uh, all focused on the health of neighborhoods, and so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the neighborhood focus that we have. Um, globally, we are all around making sure that we bring people together around the support of, of the health of our neighborhoods and making sure people have a better, a decent place to live. And that decent place to live has to do not only with the housing that you live in day in and day out, but the neighborhoods in which you live as well. And that we take that very seriously in Chicago. Um, our work is very focused on specific neighborhoods, and we want to make sure that as we do our investments around new home construction and we get people involved locally, that we're also thinking about what's happening in the overall neighborhood that helps ensure that everyone has a decent place to live for all those in that particular community, not just those that are working with Habitat for Humanity Chicago. So we'll go to the next slide. 
So here in Habitat Chicago, we do have three distinct programs that all work together in concert around the health of neighborhoods. We have our affordable home ownership program, which is probably the one that most people are familiar with. We as Habitat, we build the homes, we bring volunteers together to build those homes. Um, and then we work with families on qualifying them for affordable loans. And so if you imagine when you are involved with Habitat as a home buyer, you are coming out and you are building your home, you are working on classes, you've been qualified for an affordable mortgage, and that mortgage is with Habitat for Humanity Chicago. So we are also the lender. And so what happens is you have two streams of work going on. You have volunteers and home buyers and our, our subcontractors and our, our staff working to build the homes. And then you have also the home buyers also going through their journey of readiness to become a future homeowner in the homes that we are building. And once that journey dovetails and we close on the home, then those buyers are paying us back for 30, up to 30 years on an affordable mortgage. Um, uh, uh, the other programs that we have that work in concert with this is we have a home buyer university. One of the things that we have found in Chicago is we have a lot of folks who are interested in home ownership, but may not be ready. And so they have work to do to prepare themselves. And so we have a home buyer university, which is all about readying folks for home ownership. And then we have a neighborhood grants initiative. And this is a program that's very unique to Chicago. Again, we bring people in Chicago together around the health of neighborhoods. And we found that as we were involved in our home construction in the two neighborhoods that we're in, that there's a lot of leaders already doing great work. And our job was to provide them access to a, some resources in which they could do the projects that brought them value. So we funded a number of different projects and we provide small community grants to neighborhood leaders who are already taking care of their neighborhood. And in that way, we partner with neighborhoods. So those are our three main programs and I'll talk a little bit more about those in just a minute. So next slide. So Chicago, we have a really bad rap, unfortunately, nationally, and it's a real challenge, right? We all know as Chicagoans, we love our, our city. We care about our city. Our city has so much wonderful work going on in it but on it, we have a big reputation problem. And that's one of the things that we at Habitat for Community Chicago recognize it is not okay for us to be looking at our city and our neighborhoods through this negative lens. And so we've done a lot of work to focus in on what are the assets in the communities in which we're working. We know that many of the communities that we're working in have strong access to transportation, they have strong housing stock, the residents and the community members are very engaged and involved in their neighbor in their neighborhood and so we focus on the health of neighborhoods because we want to lift up the work that's already happening in this amazing city we also know there's been a history of disinvestment so if any if any folks have kind of looked into the history of chicago and many other cities we have neighborhoods that have had been historically redlined we have folks been uh, companies have been pulling out of neighborhoods resources have been uh, moved to other communities and so we have a great deal of disinvestment that's gone in, on in chicago where we need to reverse the tide of that of that those decades long work of disinvesting in neighborhoods so in Habitat Chicago, we take a very focused approach to amplifying the assets and shifting the trajectory of the neighborhoods so that we can build opportunity and equity in those communities. So currently on the slide, you'll see that there's two neighborhoods that are highlighted. Those two neighborhoods, I'm actually, yep. Those two neighborhoods are West Pullman and Greater Grand Crossing. So the far south side neighborhood that's way down the south, almost outside of the city, is West Pullman. That's the neighborhood that we've been in for the last 10 years when we, where we've been focusing all of our investments. We actually have built over 30 homes in that neighborhood, all single family new construction, and then also focusing our other programs around our neighborhood grants and some other work that we've done in that particular neighborhood for a while. The, um, the second neighborhood that you see is Greater Grand Crossing. So if folks are familiar with South Shore or Woodlawn, a little bit south of Hyde Park, that's a, it's, it's kind of a mid-south neighborhood. We decided um, several years ago that we couldn't be just about West Pullman, that we needed to focus in another neighborhood. And we went out and we met with a number of neighborhood leaders. We went through a whole neighborhood assessment process to figure out what's another neighborhood that we could expand into. And we selected Greater Grand Crossing. Greater Grand Crossing is very rich in uh, neighborhood leaders for sure sure. On top of it, they have an excellent uh, education program. There's the Comer Education Foundation is very active in uh, providing access to good quality education in that neighborhood and which, which partners well with our work on housing. So we selected Greater Grand Crossing as our second neighborhood. 
The third neighborhood that we are expanding into is on the west side. It's not highlighted on here, but if folks are familiar with the Austin neighborhood, it's on the west side, just uh, if you're going on 290 and you're headed towards Oak Park, you're going through the Austin neighborhood. So Austin neighborhood is something that's coming online for us. They actually came to us and they were loving what we were doing uh, in our, the neighborhoods that we're in. And they said, we would like to provide access to affordable home ownership and other programs that you all do in the west side of Chicago. So would you come to Austin? And after much discussion, uh, we said, yes, we would. And then a pandemic hit. And so we slowed down on that front, um, but we are re-engaging in conversations with the Austin community to expand to that neighborhood. And so you probably look at this map and you say, you know, the huge city, why focus on particular neighborhoods? And we really took that approach um, about about eight, nine years ago, we decided it was really important that we focus our work because we want to make sure that we're not only just focused on the home buyers that are buying the homes with Habitat, we're thinking about the overall health of the neighborhood. So we're thinking about what other homeowners are there, other businesses, what else is going on that we can positively impact the trajectory of a neighborhood by focusing our efforts. We could build all over the city of Chicago, and that is a, that's a, a many habitats do spread themselves out over a, a, all sorts of different neighborhoods in a city. But in Chicago, it's a city of neighborhoods. And we thought it was really important that if we're gonna make a larger impact, not only the investments that we make, but having a ripple effect, we really need to focus our efforts. And that has been our, our focus the last, um, the last eight years. All right, we can go to the next slide. So I mentioned a little bit about our affordable home ownership program. Again, this is the one that most folks know us for. And we do, um, this is our biggest program. The one that is the, uh, the biggest focus for our organization is qualifying and readying uh, families for affordable home ownership. So many of the, the folks that come to us, they typically are not gonna qualify for a bank loan. They are lower income and they might have credit challenges and other things that are barriers to them being able to own a home. So they work with us to go through a qualification process and they invest hundreds of hours in our program, both on volunteering on our build sites, going through home buyer classes, getting prepared to become a homeowner. And so they start out with a quali the qualify um, part of this journey and they have to go through, they have to have, they have to have a need for housing, they have to have a, a need for affordable housing, they have to have the ability to make the monthly mortgage payments back to Habitat, and they have to have the willingness to partner, which are those classes and those volunteer hours. Once they're qualified, they go through the partnering process with us, which they're doing hundreds of volunteer hours with us and 12 to 15 um, home buyer classes. And then the last part of that journey is where I talked about the beginning, where everything dovetails together and they actually become an owner of their home and they have an affordable loan with Habitat for Humanity for up to 30 years. So we also stay in contact with all of our homeowners because their loan is with us now. And so we are in regular contact, continuing to watch how things are going, be a support to those homeowners um, and helping them to be successful long term. Uh, we have done uh, about, over the last five years, we've done about 25 homes. We're kind of ranging between 10 and 15 homes a year now. So that's one of the things that we're working on um, growing our home construction, as you can imagine. That's the biggest, uh, biggest budget item we have is building new homes. Um, and we've got currently about 16 home buyers in the program right now. So they're all on that journey. So next slide. So just a couple of pictures here from our neighborhood. So I mentioned that, you know, we take a neighborhood approach. So on the upper left-hand side is a block of homes in West Pullman. Uh, it's now 18 single family homes. It once was a completely vacant uh, block of property. And we actually working across the street where, we, where we're doing 10 homes across the street from that. We've got about four of those are done now. Um, so again, we we're looking at building neighborhoods. So it's not just onesies and twosies all over. We are really focusing on making maximum impact in a particular neighborhood. Um, so that is West Pullman. Uh, you see a couple of our families on this block. You can see an overhead shot. Uh, that's actually that street is now done. That's that all those homes are done. But that was an in progress shot of uh, the block that we did. Um, and we really do uh, take seriously the work of building homes. It's really a mobilizing factor for our for the neighborhood for our volunteers who come out and help us build these homes and all of our home buyers. Next slide. 
So I mentioned a little bit about Homebuyer University. This was out of this program grew out of a real need that we had in our organization, where we were really struggling to find people who are ready to be homeowners. And you know, after the 2008 housing crisis, a lot of folks thought homeownership is dead; it's not going to be something that people really focus on. And what we're finding is people really want to be homeowners. They don't always know how to become a homeowner. And so, in, in an effort to step into that space, we created Homebuyer University. And this is a series of courses that are designed to help people get on that path and be ready to become a homeowner. Now, whether they become a homeowner with Habitat or they go through a traditional lender or they go through another affordable housing lender, we actually are open to all of that. Our goal is not necessarily to get them to buy a Habitat home. What we want is more people buying homes in Chicago. And so that is the focus of this program. So folks focus on a number of different um, classes, everything from you know how do you just launch your home buyer journey to uh, looking at the costs of home ownership, knowing what the lenders know, uh, maximizing how do you maximize your dollars, how do you think about about uh, what do you need to know about mortgages? You know, for those who've never been on it, who maybe come from families who've always rented, becoming a homeowner is a completely new journey, and there's so much to learn. We're really proud of this program. All of the classes are taught by volunteers. So we've been, we brought in, we've got realtors, bankers, all sorts of folks who volunteer their time and their talents to help educate people on what it come, what it takes to become a home uh, homeowner. Um, it's a really powerful program. Uh, just we're just a couple years old since 2019 we've had 95 students graduate and we've had 98 percent of those uh, graduates have increased their knowledge so it's been a really powerful program and we're seeing a lot of uptake and growth in this particular program people are very curious about becoming a homeowner and next slide is our neighborhood grants initiative. This is not a program that you'll see a lot of habitats do. We, we kind of decided it was a time for us to, we were looking at innovating in our work, especially as we look at um, the importance of investing in neighborhoods and communities. And so we create this program uh, around uh, how do we how do we support the already good leadership that's in the communities in which we're involved in? And so we provide small grants to residents in focused neighborhoods and, and support what they wanna do. And so we really focus on two things. We wanna know that neighbors are coming together around physical improvements in their neighborhood and social cohesion. So all the projects are focused on those two outcomes. How are you improving your neighborhood with physical improvements and what are you doing to bring people together? So it can't, it's not an individual program, so it's, it's a program in which people can't uh, an individual cannot apply. It has to be a group of at least six people coming together. They could be part of a formal organization. They could be just a formal informal group of neighbors coming together to collectively work on things that they want to do in their neighborhood. And we've done all sorts of different projects. And I say we, I mean, we've provided the funding grants between $800 to $1,500, so not a lot of money. And we provide the funds and the neighbors come together with their ideas of what they wanna do and they apply to this program. And they've done everything from planters on corners, like big anchor planters on corners to give a sense of physical space and like beauty in the, on a block to uh, uh, we've had one neighborhood group do a whole a holiday lighting project where they lit up the entire street in, uh, in colored lights for the holidays. We've had folks do back to school drives around book bags. And um, we had one group that was really impressive there. They completely redid the basketball court, repainted the basketball court in their neighborhood. They had the police come out and be they had did a roll call with the police. And then they had a, a police and neighborhood uh, community basketball tournament. So making those connections and working together. Um, and so there's been a number of different projects and it it's really up to the creativity of neighbors. This came out of, a, you know, there was a time when we were trying to do some of these pro projects on our own where we would come out and we would do a bunch of exterior repairs and such, which are important. But what we found through that is at the end of the day, our volunteers would leave and really the resident leaders take care of the neighborhood on and on. Like all of us, we all live in neighborhoods. We take care of our neighborhoods. So we wanted to be part of being a partner and an ally to the neighbors and what they want to do rather than it being habitat centric, it's neighbor centric and helping people make those connections within their neighborhood. We're really proud of this program small amounts ninety four thousand dollars have gone out in the last uh since 2019 but we've reached over twelve thousand people through this program so it has a far reach uh in this in this particular work so next slide 
So the future, and we are very focused on growing what we're doing here in Chicago. Habitat is a very localized organization. And so we have the, the opportunity to do so much in Chicago and we recognize we are this amazing city and there's a ton of opportunity for investing and doing more together. So right now we've got, um, we're planning to expand our home, affordable home ownership program. Our five-year goal is we wanna be in each of our focus neighborhoods doing 10 homes a year in each of our focus neighborhoods. So you imagine you do 10 homes a year in West Pullman and then again in West Pullman and again in West Pullman and then within five years you've got 50 homes. We wanna do that in all the neighborhoods that we're in. That's a huge ramp up for us. It's a big growth that we need to do. Um, but we're excited for that because we know that, that that impact of doing 10 homes a year over and over and over again will create a huge investment in those neighborhoods and huge change over a period of five years. That's massive change. So that is what we're working towards. Um, we also want to make sure we're in, uh, educating more aspiring home buyers throughout that public university program, Home Buyer University. And so we have a five-year goal of having 160 uh, potential buyers and uh, grad, um, and at least 80 of those graduate. So we're looking at a, 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 at least um, a 50% um, graduation rate on that. Um, and then the last one, which I talked about, was our community grants program, that neighborhood grants. We want to have at least uh, $60,000 in grants per neighborhood. So again, scaling our reach through that particular program. Some things that are coming up that we're really excited about, you know, we're gonna, you know, these are existing programs that we're gonna continue to grow, but we've got some really exciting work that we've built out into our five-year plan. And one of those is to create a home by a home repair program. One of the things we find over and over again, and we get a lot of calls about, is a lot of folks living in their communities are struggling just to take care of their home. There's roof issues, there's window issues, uh, there's uh, how do you stabilize a, um, and help somebody stay, sh uh, stay in place uh, safely as they age. And so we are uh, launching, a, we're working on uh, launching a home buyer, a home repair program for existing homeowners so that they can uh, be able to better stay where they are. We're talking with the city, there's a lot of funding come from the city for this program we're really excited to be able to lift this up because we get calls every day and in the neighborhoods that we're in the houses are aging and so we want to make sure that we can stabilize that keep people in their homes so that those homes don't go into further disrepair so that's one big program the second thing that we're doing is we are becoming much more coalition focused. And this came out of the Austin work. When Austin reached out to us, it was a coalition of organizations that had a quality of life plan. They came to us and they said, one of our goals in our quality of life plan is home ownership. And that started us thinking about our work probably needs to be much more in collaboration with existing organizations and other folks coming together. So we, in our current plan, we've switched to become more coalition centric. So we will be joining joining the Austin Coming Together Coalition, which is in the Austin neighborhood. We also recently joined the Far South Chicago Coalition, which encompasses that West Pullman neighborhood on the far south side. They have a quality of life plan as well, and home ownership is one of their key goals. Um, they also have a number of other amazing goals that dovetail with a lot of our other programs. So that is another piece of this. And then the, the last piece is, you know, as we advance our work, we are looking at internally at our organization and then programmatically, how are we building equity, inclusion, and representation throughout our organization? Um, we have a lot of work to do on this. Our staff needs to evolve and change to be more rep representative of the neighborhoods in which we work. We're working on that with our board as well. And then we're looking at also, are our programs truly responsive and responsible to the neighbors, the neighborhoods and the neighbors with, with whom we work. So that is a critical component for long-term success. I'm really proud of those steps that we've taken so far, but we have a lot more work to do on this front because the organization will be better when we have much more representation from the community in, involved in it. And then many of you may have heard about Mackenzie Scott's generous giving that she's been doing these last several years. And we recently received a $2.5 million gift from Mackenzie Scott. Uh, there were, um, it was just one of those wonderful moments where we got contacted and we're notified that we were receiving this gift. And then we found out afterwards that not only did we receive this, but 83 other habitats across the United States, as well as Habitat Humanity International, our parent organization, also received a gift. So Mackenzie Scott has given $436 million, her largest gift to any one organization, 
to Habitat for Humanity. And Habitat for Humanity Chicago was one of those habitats that was honored with this gift and this opportunity. And so our challenge now is to take this as a catalytic moment and use it to scale and advance what we're doing. And that includes how do we scale our fundraising to reach more, to do more of our programs. So we are looking at this as an investment in greater growth for our organization. And we're very excited about this opportunity. Next slide. Here's a couple of um, uh, quotes from a couple of uh, the folks who have gone through our program. One is um, with our neighborhood grants initiative, and then the other is one of our former home buyers, now homeowner, uh, Joyce. And so I invite you to read their words. I, um, if you ever get a chance to uh, come to a Habitat event and meet anybody involved in our organization, uh, the neighbors and our home buyers and homeowners are just a tremendous people who really care about their neighborhoods. And um, their words are the ones we should be listening to because they are powerful, powerful people. Go to the next slide. So I just want to wrap up here. I know I've spent uh, much of this talking about some of our programs, but I really am curious about what you'd like to know about Habitat for Humanity. Again, you know, we are very focused in Chicago, but we are a global organization. I have worked for Habitat for Humanity International, so I have the I've the international experience as well as the local experience. So I'm open to any questions you may have about our local work or our global work. So again, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you for that. We will start with questions in the room, and Karen has a microphone that we'll send around. Uh, it's a, a couple of questions. Maybe you mentioned them, and I missed them. Number one, uh, is there sweat equity included? Yes. One. Second, what is the, the average price of a house? Number three, what is the average income to which you are going to sponsor a house? That's great. All three great questions. So yeah, sweat equity is the, we call it volunteer hours, but also sweat equity. Yeah. So all of our home buyers have to put in a minimum of 350 hours volunteering in our organization. And that most of that volunteering is on the build site. That's usually what folks are doing. That's what's most accessible for folks. And so they're building their homes, they're building their neighbors' homes. Uh, they're getting to know the volunteers on the build site. Um, but sometimes they also volunteer here in our restore, which is a retail operation we have, or they can volunteer in our office. So there's any number of ways in which people can volunteer. Um, and so those are all of our home buyers do have to put in those hours, which is commonly called in the habitat vernacular sweat equity. So yes. Um, in terms of our home costs, so we do new construction. Our home costs are around $220,000 right now with without our staff costs that's strictly with all of land all of the subcontractors all the material costs that's about two hundred and twenty thousand dollars i will tell you we are continuing to monitor that because with the supply chain issues we have had we've had we're um seeing those costs rise and so that's a very real challenge that we're working on is how do we continue to make sure those homes are affordable um, because we've been impacted by the challenges of of construction materials just like everybody else has and your third question was income, correct? Income, income yes. So in Habitat, uh, we cannot sell above 80% of area median income. So we have an income limit of all of our home buyers are no more than 80% of area median income. And in, in the in Chicago area, it's about that's about $74,000 for a family of four. And then we go down to 40% of area median income. So we have a band that we're looking at. Anybody below 40% of area median income usually doesn't have enough income in order to be able to take care of a home on an ongoing basis. So we have that that band that we're always looking at based on family size to make sure it's affordable but also that they if they're above 80 percent they can usually find other lending products so yeah thanks oh, oh, yes it's a an area question west pullman mm -hmm. and uh roseland are they the same 
they actually are neighbors. So yeah, so on the far south side, West Pullman is just right at the bottom of the city of Chicago and Roseland's immediately right above it, just north of it. But I will tell you, it's often called as Greater Roseland. And that when they talk about Greater Roseland, they're talking about several of the neighborhoods that are on the far south side, including West Pullman, including Pullman. I'm not sure if folks have visited Pullman at all, which has a lot of historical significance in Chicago. Um, all of that area is often called Greater Roseland. Yeah, but they are distinct neighborhoods. I won't take a lot of time, <clears throat> but the history of Roseland vis-a-vis -vis Pullman is really quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, I had two quick questions for you. Your program, um, are the loans specifically for your housing or can they go through your program to acquire something that they may already be living in that they could possibly afford? And then number two, um, the neighborhoods that you pick, they're, they're, I, being from Chicago in the South Side, there are other neighborhoods that are a little bit more um, income challenged and obviously have a lot more open land available to build houses on. So why not choose some of those neighborhoods that could really, you know, benefit from housing rises raised and things like that versus someone like Greater Grand Crossing or West Pullman that's a little bit higher of an income and a little bit higher. That's both excellent questions, both excellent questions. So in terms of our pro our loan product is specific to Habitat. So if people are buying a home with Habitat, they are going through the process of, of both buying a home that we build with them, and then the loan product is through Habitat. So it is currently 0% interest, which helps make it affordable for folks, which is no one else does zero percent interest. Habitat is the only one in that space. Um, but yes, uh, so it is only through only through us. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of neighborhoods, we've we've been doing a lot of evolution and discussion over this over the last many years. So when we when I first started, we had a sixteen lots in West Pullman, and we had a redevelopment agreement with the city of Chicago, and we started to look at this and we said, okay, we can build these sixteen houses. Or should we think about doing more? And so we uh, brought in a community development consultant who spent a couple months with us looking at West Pullman. We went out and we did uh, met with other community groups, other organizations, we talked with residents, we did an asset mapping process, and we learned that there were so many more assets in West Pullman that we wanted to tap into and became aware of that we should be working more cohesively through the, out the whole neighborhood and not just on those 16 lots. That if we're gonna um, really be an impactful organization, we need to be more thoughtful and more comprehensive. With that said, uh, we, it has been an evolution over the last several years to look at our work in West Pullman and then our work into expanding into other neighborhoods. And we actually settled, you know, settled on really wanting to focus on what we call middle neighborhoods. And so there are lots of neighborhoods that are neighborhoods that are, um, where the real estate market is very hot, right? And you know, uh, we commonly call the neighborhoods on the north side, where they're very attractive neighborhoods and and very expensive neighborhoods and very hot neighborhoods. They're getting a lot of attention, but there are also neighborhoods that don't get a lot of attention, but also have a lot of good things going for them. And so those are commonly called middle neighborhoods. And so we actually did a, a lot of research and looking into should we be focusing our efforts more into middle neighborhoods, and not to the neighborhoods that are necessarily more challenged much more challenged with lack of housing and lots of vacant parcels, higher rental rates, et cetera. And, and it was an int intentional decision we made because we wanted to catch a neighborhood in before it starts to decline. We want to do investments now so that the, the opportunity to help positively affect its trajectory, it's a, it's a little bit easier way in to help it with a positive trajectory now rather than waiting another 10 years and possibly seeing the loss of population more than it is right now. There's a lot of south side neighborhoods that are losing population and it's a very real challenge and so we want to attract people back to affordable middle neighborhoods and say come this is a great place to live for you and your family 
We do wrestle with this issue. I will say that um, there are. Uh, we've talked with folks in Englewood. We've talked and uh, talked with folks in a number of different neighborhoods who've said we'd like to have Habitat come here. I think we've come to the place of for now we're going to continue to focus on middle neighborhoods and also co that coalition becomes really center. So you know now we're moving into Austin as we get our feet around being more coalition centric. There may be times in the future where additional newer coalitions come up and say, hey, Habitat, can you come into this neighborhood and join us in that effort? It's We are finding that to do the work alone is not, and not, not that we're doing it entirely alone, but to not be more focused on the coalition work is, is not wise for us long term. There's so many other good things going on in other neighborhood leaders, and we need to be in alignment and join those efforts and not be a, alone in those. So, it, But it has been a discussion that we've had around where do we go and what type of neighborhood do we tackle? So middle neighborhoods is where we settled on and also with a coalition focus. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you may have mentioned this, and I apologize if you did. Um, do you build only single family housing? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. But I uh, can I add on to that. Uh, so, uh, yes, we do currently uh, single family new construction uh, on the, the, the things that are in the on the docket for us in terms of expanding our work is we are looking at multifamily where we've got a, a parcel of land that where we'd like to do 20 townhomes. Uh, we've uh, and that's in West Pullman. And then we have a whole other parcel of land that we're in the process of acquiring right now in Greater Grand Crossing, which we're going to be meeting with. We're going to be going through a process of working with community members to talk about what do they envision for that parcel. It could be single family. The feedback might be they'd like to see multifamily. And so we're going to be going through a process of discussion and discernment with community members about that because it's we're able to assemble uh, quite a bit of property in Greater Grand Crossing to focus. So we uh, would like to move into multifamily. And I would also just to add on one other thought is people always ask us about why aren't you guys rehabbing? And um, because there are homes that could be rehabbed and and we would like to get there. Uh, it is in our plans to move into rehab in the next couple of years. But as folks who may be in the rehab business, there's a whole specialization that goes into assessing rehabs and into figuring out what the right budget is for rehabs. And you take a wall out and then you find out some sort of mold problem that's huge that you didn't budget for. So we want to be really good at single family, expand into townhomes, and then figure out how do we add on rehab following that. Yeah. I have a follow up. Uh, hi, I'm Chuck. I have a follow up question to the rehab answer that you just gave. Um, do you get involved at all as the organization looking at possibly in the area of the community um, enhancement uh, that you were talking about? Uh, many, many homes um, in certain areas are vacant and, or, and some of them boarded up and, and many of them are dilapidated condition. Is there any efforts at all looking at how some of these homes can be uh, demolished and for a future plan to build on? Um, maybe you can bank the land or whatever. Yeah, we actually stay in touch with uh, both the city of Chicago and with uh, Cook County Land Bank Authority to identify property that we may have an interest in if the city would take it down and then we could come in and take it over. Uh, so yeah, we have a really great relationship with both the city's Department of Housing and um, and the Cook County Land Bank because there are properties that we have an interest in that, you know, nothing's going to happen. It can't really be rehabbed in a way that'll be healthy for a family it does need to come down and we've been able to tell the city we're interested in these properties can you start to get them prepped for us that's been a work in progress i will tell you though i mean that's what's our trajectory in chicago is not um it's you know it takes a while to build solid great relationships with your municipality and so we're at a place right now where we've been able to build that and we can tell them we're very interested in this over here so yeah yeah um, jane could you give us an idea of <clears throat> the source of your funding how you you know how you fund all of these projects yeah that's a great question uh so much of our funding is philanthropic so we do a, 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 they kind of come into a, a couple of different buckets if you will so um so individual giving so individuals uh and major gifts so people individually saying i want to donate my dollars to habitat for humanity chicago and so we do that through um you know we've got a major giving program we've got a regular uh, monthly giving program um, so all of those are options for people 
to to give and we have a, a whole program around that uh, we have various events so we actually have our annual benefit coming up as well as our women build in the fall so um, both of those are events that we run where we uh, have peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and campaigns around helping to raise funds in support of the organization there uh, we do some uh, foundation grants and so some uh, we do have some grants we have a lot of room to go on grants in all honesty where that's an area that we haven't um, raised as much as many dollars um, but the other area that I would say besides individual giving the other very strong area has been our corporate giving it's we're building it back we've had um, when the pandemic hit it really went off a cliff um, but we have a strong uh, commitment from the corporate community historically to support habitat and much of that is through team build so companies will come out and bring their team and they'll build with us and they will donate to our organization through that through that um, partnership and helping to fund our mission. Uh, we've been really grateful. Um, some of the partnerships that we've been building the last couple of years have uh, become multi-year partnerships. So it's not just a one-year partnership, but it's a three-year, we've had a couple of three-year significant partnerships that uh, occurred just at the end of uh, 20, what year is it? We're in 2022, end of 2021, we had a number of, of significant corporate partners step forward. So yeah, so those are kind of the, the main buckets. Um, we are working on trying to get ac more access to public funding in all honesty. I've stayed away from public funding to some degree for those who may be involved in raising funds public funds comes with lots of restrictions and lots of compliance and so we are working to build our organization up to be able to do that because as i said earlier we've got a repair program we want to lift up and we think public funding is probably the place to do that but most all of it is philanthropic um, and so that's been a real uh, the support of chicago and chicago inns who say i want to be part of this mission i want to support this work uh, so that's where most of our fundraising comes from Sure, sure. Let me think. So um, Betsy, who's on my team and who's here with me today, um, she's our development director, so she really knows all about fundraising. Um, also just mentioned about Restore. So um, if you haven't ever been to a Restore, I encourage you to go to one. Restore is a, a, a social enterprise, if you will, where it's a, a, a store that we run, where we sell new and used building supplies, um, uh, cabinets, doors, uh, windows, furniture, anything that you'd want. If you walk into a Home Depot, except for the furniture part of it, if you walk into a Home Depot, you can find a lot of the same stuff at our Restore. And then we also have a very strong uh, furniture part of our of our business in Restore. Our Restore is actually currently in the Saganash neighborhood on the far south, far north side of Chicago. We are looking to expand um, to have at least three Restores in Chicago in different parts of the city. And what happens is anybody can go and shop there and it's reduced prices on everything. And then the funds that is that we raise through that um, comes right back and funneling back into the mission. So it's another way in which we um, raise dollars for the for the organization. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, so I'm going to look and see for questions in the chat. Yes, I see it. The one about Switzerland. Yes. Do you have an office in Switzerland? We have a Rotarian who's moving there and would like to get involved. That's good. You know, now, that one I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that we do. We can we right. We can look it up and see. Um, I will tell you there is um, our our. Um, our Habitat for International, our parent organization, our website is habitat.org. So it's a very simple uh, web uh, URL. Um, there are where all the countries that we are in. So you can easily go there and look up in Europe, where are we, where are our offices? I will share that in many of the European countries that we're active in, those are more fundraising nations. They've Many of them have, have housed, their housing is not central to something they need to provide for people in their country. They provide it, but they've been able to provide it in a different way than nonprofits that don't need to step into that space. So um, we do have a lot of fundraising nations in Europe. Um, I don't know if we have Switzerland, but I know habitat.org will tell us if they if we're in Switzerland. Okay, so uh, one more question, time? Okay, uh, can I donate kitchen supply items to the ReStore? So it depends on what kitchens, how you define kitchen supplies. I know that we have, uh, we have taken, we do take cabinets and refrigerators and those sorts of things. Um, those we definitely will take. Um, in terms of uh, dishes and uh, um, 
dinnerware, things like that, that's more limited. We don't take that nearly as much. Uh, frequently, we kind of are in a different space than Goodwill. Goodwill takes a lot of the things that, you know, there are more um, small pieces and some uh, um, and uh, clothing and the like. With uh, Habitat, we tend to take more things that are around building the home, if you will. So anything that would go into a home around, um, around cabinets and, and refrigerators, appliances, that sort of stuff. So we tend to take that stuff. And I will share, I mean, we are Habitat for Humanity Chicago and we love our work in Chicago. There are habitats all throughout the region. So, you know, if you're at, located in Elgin or you're located in Joliet or somewhere else um, in the Chicago region, there are multiple habitats and there are multiple restores. So I just offer that up because while I would love for folks to get involved with Habitat Chicago, I also encourage you, if it's more convenient to get involved in another habitat or visit another restore, please do. All the work that's being done by all of our habitat organizations is really impactful and important. So thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, let's give another round of applause for our speaker for today. Thank you very much. And um, Karen, has that karaoke event happened yet? Because, you know, as Ms. Parks, we indicated, was it over? Oh, I was gonna invite her to karaoke as a member of the chorus, right? That would have been nice. <laughs> okay. So we here at Rotary uh, would like to recognize uh, Ms. Jen Parks for speaking to us today and sharing your time and valuable knowledge with us. Thank you very much for that. So with that, uh, we'll be moving on to our next segment with a member induction. So I'm going to call Ms. Alita up here for our member induction. Hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure on the behalf of the Board of Directors and the members of the Rotary Club of Chicago to welcome you, Franklin, as a member of Rotary One. We welcome you not only for the fine fellowship that we, we, we shall share, but also for your talents, abilities, and enthusiasm that will help us to carry out our many projects to make our community, our country, and the world a better place in which to live. Rotary is not a political organization, but all Rotarians are vitally concerned with everything pertaining to good citizenship and the election of good men and women to public office. Rotary is not a charitable organization, yet its activities exemplify the charity and the sacrifices that one should expect from people who believe that they have responsibility to help others. Rotary is not a religious organization, but it is built on those eternal principles that have served as many of the moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business and professional people pledged to upholding the highest professional standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and international peace can be achieved when business people unite under the banner of service. Franklin has been chosen for membership in the Rotary Club of Chicago because your fellow Rotarians believe you to be a leader in your profession and because you manifest the intelligence and commitment of heart that fit you to interpret and impart the message of Rotary. You are a representation of your profession in this club and any information of educational value pertaining to that profession must naturally come to us through you. At the same time, you become an ambassador for, uh, from us to your profession, and we rely on you to carry the principles and ideals of service, which we here aspire to those who share your professional activity. The community will know and judge Rotary by your embodiment of it in character and service. And we accept you as a member because we know our principal and organization will be safe in your keeping. We also expect you to give us the inspiration that will help us to become better Rotarians. And it is with this hope that I ask Sarah. There you go. To invest you with the distinguishing pen of a Rotarian and gladly offer you the right hand of Rotary Fellowship.
go. And we, oh, oops, I dropped it. And he also gets the pen for our annual pen and our district pen, the birthplace of Rotary. Wonderful. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now, Franklin, can you just let us know a little bit about you and where you're from and what's your profession? All right. Well, um, I'm a native from uh, Caracas, Venezuela, and I um, came to the United States in 1990 to pursue a master's degree with a wonderful principal fluid of New York Philharmonic, Julius Baker. And then um, I completed a master's degree there, and then I moved to Indiana for a performance diploma. I completed a PhD in, in Latin American literature there. And then I got a tenure track in Moscow, Idaho University. And finally, we landed in Chicago in 2001. And this is home for us since 2001. And um, I, you know, years ago, I have a very, like my brother in Venezuela, in an island of Margarita in Venezuela. He has been a retirement for years. Uh, he owns a business there. And, and he always told me, hey, you should, you should, you should try. And we work in Harold Washington, which is pretty close. And I, I, I think I came to one meeting years ago, but you meet at, on Tuesday. And uh, you know, Tuesday at, at 12 and is prime time for getting a class there. So I had to postpone it. But thanks to pandemic, <laughs> and because we are working remotely and it's not going to change and, and online, I say, well, now is the time to jump and complete that goal. So here I am. And I feel uh, very proud, very honored, and nice words. I mean, very, you know, I appreciate that. Um, I hope that I can help somehow um, the Rotary Club as, you know, the work that you have been doing for so many years. It's my honor. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you and welcome again. So it's that point in a meeting where we introduce our guests and I'll start in the room. In the room, do we have any visiting international Rotarians? Any visiting US Rotarians? Well, it's a pleasure to be here at uh, Rotary One where Paul Harris started. This is uh appreciated very much to be sitting by the president and the chair of the uh, rotary house yesterday the where paul harris lived i got to tour it it was a really big pleasure spent a few hours uh was an honor to contribute to it and uh, i live i'm from suburban omaha nebraska anybody heard of omaha <laughs> and uh and i'm also involved with the habitat for humanity for iowa and nebraska so that's a great speech for today because of our uh, involvement of our foundation there. And uh, I had a very boring life because I spent 43 years perfect attendance in Rotary. <laughs> when I tell that to people, I say, get a life, you know, but uh, I, my life has been Rotary and my friends are Rotarians and my life is Rotary. And every Thursday at noon, all I look forward to is getting to Rotary. I do business with Rotarians. Um, Got twin boys, 24, and uh, all I hope one day is that they'll be Rotarians. Uh, I think I'm probably the youngest that ever joined Rotary since Paul Harris started Rotary in 1905. I was 19 years old, and uh, so when I used to go up and say my birthday, I'd say they'd say you're you know you got to tell your age or you got fined. So I said 20, 21, and they'd all boo. Now I say 64, nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> So it's a, uh, I'm also honored to be an Arch Clump Society member. So I don't know if anybody are familiar with that, but it's been an honor to be part of that program. And so I love Rotary and I'm glad to be here. All right, thank you. Welcome. Great to have you. And then any guests of Rotary in the room today? Um, well, I would like to introduce my part of my family, which is my, my wife, so I'm trying to bring her also to the Rotarian Club, and my son, uh, Daniel. 
Well, I am almost convinced. <laughs> my almost. Mind it. <laughs> What's the little part we still need then? Oh, you don't need any parts. It's okay. just, you know, conversation. Almost. Yeah. Uh, and there is a good incentive, actually. Uh, so, yeah, we are very pleased. I, this is my second visit with him. And this is our first visit for our son, Daniel, that he can tell about his interests. Um, I don't know how much there is to say about myself. Um, I am currently on a leave of absence from uh, studying at Yale. Um, so I'm here in Chicago for the next few months and it's been interesting. I, I've been, it, it's easy when working towards the bachelors to forget that there are many other ways to uh, actively be involved with other people and try and make things a bit better in a world that can be a little bit discouraging at times. Um, so I appreciated coming here and seeing the work that's been done and uh, hopefully we'll be leaving here a little bit more inspired and hopeful to participate in some of the community related work that's being done. Great. Welcome. Okay, do we have any guests on zoom who would like to be introduced besides my parents, but I won't make them speak. My parents are visiting us today on Zoom, but I won't make them speak. Uh, anyone else? Any visiting Rotarians on Zoom? I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. You know, I think it was Eric that told me that one of my toughest duties as a president will be uh, getting people to introduce themselves. So <laughs> anyone? If there's anyone on Zoom who'd like to introduce themselves, please feel free to unmute. And now you all know what it feels like to be a teacher on Zoom. <laughs> okay, so I don't hear anyone speaking. I don't see anyone unmuting. So we'll go ahead and move on. Um, I'm gonna bring Alita back up here uh, to talk to us about job one and needing employers. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Hello, um, job one. Um, that is our signature program in which we help train high school juniors and seniors to work professional jobs. And we love to work with nonprofits. <laughs> um, we um, place them with nonprofits and other organizations and employers throughout the city of Chicago for an eight to 10 week summer internship at whatever the going minimal wage is, which is $15 an hour this year. Um, they work 20 to 40 hours a week, and we are waiting for all of you all to jump up and say you want to take a student. We have we just finished our second um, training this week where we went over social media etiquette and email etiquette and how to get ready for the workforce, get ready for that search. And next week we do resumes and we do resume review. So any of our Rotarians who would like to be a part, we have a virtual and an in-person option. The virtual is this weekend. Next weekend is in person at Link Unlimited. So if anyone of our Rotarians are interested in coming out and helping review some resumes, feel free to email me or the office or job one at rotary1.club. And we look forward to that. And if there are anyone, I'm sorry, we also have PAWS that have come on board again this year to take two students, but PAWS cannot afford to pay for the student completely. We reimburse 50% for our students. So we need a wonderful donor to please donate the other 50% so that we can cover the cost for our students that are going to pause. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alita. So just wrapping things up here with a few announcements. Uh, the Rotary One Karaoke Social that was supposed to be this week on Thursday has been canceled. We have some upcoming committee meetings. You can see um, who the chairs are and when those committees are meeting, the PR and Marketing Committee, International Service Committee, the Community Service Committee, and the Membership Committee. You can see when they are next meeting and the times. So if you're interested in getting a little bit more involved with the committee, please feel free to join. For upcoming meetings on April 26th, 
Well, I'll start with the round table. On, on April 22nd is our next round table here at the Union League Club. You don't need to register for that. You just come and enjoy some food and some fellowship. On April 26th, that is a hybrid meeting with Jeannie Long, who's the executive director for the Chicago Collections Consortium. May 3rd is our next Rotary After Work at 5.30. It will be held at the Bronzeville YMCA with a tour and a speaker. This is an in-person only event. And then on May 10th, we have Governor Jim Edgar here at the Union League Club, which is a hybrid meeting. So be on the lookout for all of those registration links. And then before we adjourn, uh, I have been told that today is the last meeting uh, in person in Chicago meeting for one of our long term members and his exit exam is going to be leading us in the four way test if he will accept. Oh, of course, did you plan that. <laughs> so john, please, if you accept lead us in the four-way test is it fair to all concerned will it build goodwill and better friendships will it be beneficial to all concerned and with that thank you very much that brings our meeting to a close thank you very much for being here and i look forward to seeing you next time